Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Next. I am your host, Mike Walker, and today we're going to continue our panel conversation. This is part three out of a three-part series. So uh, we're wrapping up the panel here in this episode. Uh, obviously, there was a lot uh, to go through and talk about when you're looking at evaluating 30 technologies on an emerging technologies hype cycle. Uh, so uh, it takes a little while, right? Uh, but when you flavor that with having some, some nice bourbon, it may draw things out a little bit. So in this episode, we're continuing that conversation. We're going to go deeper into how each one of us uses the hype cycle, uh, uh, giving Gartner some credit where credit's due, uh, along with some of the challenges with uh, some of the things we felt were missing from the hype cycle. So with that, let's get into it. Uh shift uh, a rune to talk about a little bit because he's passionate and he's done a lot of good things around uh, this particular area um and i think this applies to all of us in, in our day jobs uh was really the um the sustainability tech i thought that was a really big topical miss uh for the hype cycle and, and you know part of it because i used to work for gartner i get why that might not be as much of a focus because their primary constituency is you know, more mainstream companies, you know, uh, uh, that that might not be front and center. But we're going to see regulation that's going to force your hand, you know, whether even if it's U.S. or not U.S., uh, we're going to see people being forced to be compliant with uh, some sort of emission, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, so what I really, really was hoping to see was more of that sustainability tech, whether it be things like, you know, uh, vertical farming, fusion, solar, wind, uh, you know, there's there's lots of different tech. I mean, um, uh, carbon capture uh, is starting to become really, really big as well. And what every company can do and, you know, what sort of tax incentive they can get. I mean, that hits the bottom line. Um, but I think, you know, to go back to before I lose this thread in my mind, both of your points around technology first, business first. I agree with both, and I think it it it's a big consulting question, hand wavy. It depends. You're looking at the technology for inspiration. You're saying, okay, it's just like you know, back in the day, I've got a wheel. Well, shit, I don't have anything that does wheel stuff, but I could. I could go build a pyramid. I could go make a you know a, a wheelbarrow. I can do whatever. So I think it's as long as we constantly understand your key premise, Todd, of we're doing this for a reason. We're looking at this technology to gain inspiration on how we can, one, validate our business and make sure that we're using the best technologies for what we're trying to accomplish as a business. But two, if we do figure out that, hey, yeah, you know, our competitors that are all around us, whether it be from the top, the big evil high tech companies coming in and redefining your markets, or it's from the bottom where you got, you know, the fintechs and sure tax, the whatever tax coming in saying, oh, well, we can do this better, faster, cheaper. The regulators are not on our back. Uh, you know, uh, we can break rules, you know, break the law. It doesn't matter, yada, yada, yada. And so I think as long as you keep that in mind and ground yourself in to, we're doing this for a reason. We're not just here as uh, R and D scientists. Because as soon as you go down that road, uh, and I know you don't mean this, Mike, because we've had several conversations about this. As soon as you go down that R&D lab coat route, you're you're dead in the water. You right. know, your business isn't going to listen to you and all that shit. So, um, one, uh, does that make sense to the both of you? And then, two, what do you guys think about this sustainability stuff? Yes. This is the short answer, yes, it does. And on sustainability, I was also surprised to not see more, uh, especially just in light of what consumers are demanding. Uh, I don't know that most businesses have a choice or will have a choice. Uh, there's some upside, dare I say, to cancel culture, right, where uh, companies and organizations and people are held to account and people are truly uh, valuing sustainability. And to the extent they do that, there's going to be ways to compare. So I think 
almost all companies need to be hyper aggressive to say, what can they do to reduce the footprint? What can they do to uh, be more efficient? What can they do to be more uh, innovative in a way that uh, their consumers appreciate it in a way that fits with their value system? And that's probably not indifferent to what we're seeing in uh, a larger uh, awakening of uh, racial situation and, concil and reconciliation and and what uh, people expect of companies and the positions that people in power need to take. So uh, I, I suspect that some of this is going to be a pull. It's not just gonna be the technology uh, pushing it out. And I, I would love to see a higher priority on sustainability and other areas that are more responsive to what uh, individuals want and expect of companies. And what I would say is, um, I, I, I wonder if some of this question and concern is related to what is the hype cycle and what's it there for, right? Because I think about sustainability. Sustainability at the end of the day is not a new thing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I know that um, it's been six plus years since I worked at Procter & Gamble. And for my last 10 years when I was at P&G, we were talking about sustainability. So it's been an active thing for at least 15 years as far back as I can remember, right? And so so does that mean that sustainability tech shouldn't show up on the hype cycle? Well, I don't know. Is sustainability tech really tech that's just being used for a new use case? And so it's just a spe specific kind of tech or is sustainability tech something that's new and different and exciting? And that so I think that's where I think Part of what we have to kind of reflect on what the hype cycle is and how you use the hype cycle. I do think there's still some misses, though, right? Um, I do think there are some components there to to think about. On the on the first point in the comment you made there, Mike, the the thing that jumped to my mind was was something that you and I have had some conversations about in the blockchain space specifically, and that's the idea of does it matter? whether you start with the technology or start with the need if you end with the solution, right? And, and, and the example specifically, right, is, is in the blockchain space where we've, we talked about different examples where you and some of your customer engagements, me and some of the things I'm doing at Nationwide, where we started with this idea of blockchain is this unique differentiating technology with some specific key characteristics how might we leverage it? And what we ended up with was a really powerful, impactful business solution that was blockchain inspired, right. but may not have actually used blockchain, yeah. right? So again, I think it goes back to, or just a little bit of blockchain, that's right. So it, it, goes, it goes back to uh, the, the quote that comes to my mind in this context is never let a good crisis go to waste yep. right blockchain is is a good example of of a crisis the ceo read about blockchain in the back of the airplane magazine or whatever magazine they're reading now that they can't fly on airplanes <laughs> um and they're coming and say we got to have a blockchain give it to us now right that's the crisis that's been invented and and so how do we create that business value out of that crisis and not let that crisis go to waste Right. So I think there's an element of of that, how we can be. Um, I don't know what the right word is, um, just going to take advantage of the situation to the best outcome possible. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, you know, as a disclosure, you know, I think the hype cycle is a really good, useful tool. Uh, I think to your point, Mike, and this is what I would stress as well at events, you know, we had this conversation with your team, right? Um, understanding it for what it is. And, you know, part of what it is, is kind of what we were kind of debating right now. It is supposed to be what is most relevant right now. So if, it, if a technology was on the hype cycle 10 years ago, and now it's suddenly relevant, it should be on the hype cycle. It doesn't matter if it's, I mean, AI is a great example of this. We've been talking about AI since the 50s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, it's really about the pivot, uh, and, and I don't like the word hype necessarily, but, you know, that's an inherited word from a long, long time ago. 
uh, but it's really about what is the market awareness and sensitivity to a particular technology. And this is supposed to be your barometer to say, okay, how much attention is being put on this technology and, sh and based on the amount of attention it's getting and based on some other characteristics, how should I think about this from a mental frame perspective? You should not use the hype cycle to make investment decisions, point blank. You should not. It's an input into that process. It's a good qualifier, but the hype cycle is way too subjective. And because the time dimension is very qualitative, uh, we talked about a historical aspect that there's not a whole lot of continuity around, um, you know, the life cycle of the technology itself, like augmented reality. We don't have a visual that shows it bouncing back and forth in relevance, right? <laughs> We don't have that, right? right. So it, it's 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 really meant to be for this year, uh, what, the BS meter. What what's bullshit and what's not bullshit? That's really what you know it, it's there for, and it's really really good at that. And right. you know, there's not much I can ding about the construct for that. I think the the bigger issue in my mind is whenever there is a major catalyst, a major event where people are just like, they've hit the oh shit moment. And they're like, well, what do I do? Uh, I know that digital is being thrusted upon me. I know that my consumers, they're different. They expect different things. Um, you know, now I've got governments telling me I have to do X, Y, Z. Uh, I just hope that more of those non-technical drivers and triggers influence the emerging technologies hype cycle going forward. Because I can tell you when I wrote it, like the DIY, you know, I go back to that because we've been talking about it, but the DIY biohacking, I defined the spectrum. I said, there are the very intrusive, you need surgery, you need a doctor, you need a this, to the things that are nootropics. I can take a pill that is a bunch of mushrooms that make my cognitive ability better. And so there's a spectrum here. And, you know, it could be that or it could be, uh, augmented reality contact lenses that I can put in my eye, connect to my phone, and now I can cheat on all my tests, or I can be in a board meeting and see a script and read from a script from my eyeball, which the tech it exists. Exists. Yeah. Uh, you can record video from contact lenses as well. Uh, so. Which is crazy. Yeah. Terrifying. <laughs> yes, terrifying is right. So I think, Mike, you hit on a really interesting point. You didn't make it overtly, but I think one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand about the hype cycle, and I'm assuming some of our audiences are very, very familiar with the hype cycle and some of the audience isn't, right? You may have seen the little picture, but um, the, the thing that sometimes gets missed about the hype cycle is the, um, the part along the bottom that talks about the different stages that technologies are going through, right? And, and those stages innovation trigger, peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, scope of enlightenment, and plateau of productivity are really important to what makes the hype cycle unique. And it gets back to this piece that you were just talking about, Mike, around the hype cycle is your measure of BS today, yeah. right? How much do people view this technology as as BS? If If they're viewing it as it's a lot of BS out in the market, then it's probably at the peak of, of inflated expectations. But right after that peak, there's this trough of disillusionment. That doesn't mean the technology is bad. It doesn't mean you should stop looking at it. it you should stop using it. Um, it means something else. And yeah. so one of the things – I actually used this in my conversation earlier today with some of our leadership team. Uh, we were talking about blockchain very specifically. And they were talking about, well, should we really even be thinking about blockchain anymore? It feels like two years ago it was a big deal, but now it's not nearly as much. And I pulled the hype cycle out and I said, you know what? Here's why. Blockchain in most contexts and most situations has kind of landed deep into that trough of disillusionment. Yep. And that's why what you're seeing is you're seeing – Less people really, really excited about it. You're seeing more people throwing throwing stones at it and saying it's this thing that um, 
um, that you should never even think about. And and technologies, when they get to that trough, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about this, Mike, go one of two ways. They either come back up into the 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 curve again and that – what's it called? The slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity, or they fall off, yep. right? And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so that's – so yeah, so when you get to that, well, let me take a step back. This is just as much psychology as it is technology. Because, you know, us as human beings, you know, we love to get excited about things. And we're like, oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and yada, yada, yada. And while this technology is, could be really good at, let's say, five things, when you hit the peak of inflated of expectations, that technology is praised as it's you know, it's great at a thousand things when really it's really good at five really distinct things. And the problem with that uh, at that stage is you've only got a very few uh, companies that are looking at that technology. Once you get that adoption uh, from a lot of different companies with all their different variables that they have, they start to be able to see, oh, OK, well, it's good, but it just wasn't giving us those a thousand great things. It's giving us these five to ten really great things. And so, like you said, Mike, you know, it's either exit the hype cycle as we've proven that this technology is not viable. It's not a legitimate technology that we should be using or people start to baseline that technology, mature that technology. And it's used for the uses that it was meant to be built for or that just so happens it's really good at. And so blockchain is a great example of that. You know, crypto, a lot of people got really excited about that and they thought that that was the permissioned uh, permissionless world was going to be pervasive everywhere. No, that's not going to happen. Until you kill capitalism, that's not going to happen. Um, I'll tell you that point blank. That's my my personal opinion on that. Um, so you're going to have blockchain used in enterprise settings in a permissioned way. Right. Does it help you a ton in any sort of reconciliation process? Check. Yes, it does significantly. Where I need to master data, where I don't have to do all this data cleanup and all this stuff, big check, yes. If I'm in the pharma industry and I need to track my supply chain, yes, huge benefits. Digital attestation, all that great stuff that goes along with it. So um, so, so, yes, I think that uh, we've, we think that the hype cycle is all things to all people, but you have to use this in combination with other techniques as well. You need to use it in combination with S-curves, as an example, mm -hmm. and show what the intersection is with that specific innovation technique. Um, you need to be able to take that into your ideation and trend spotting activities and qualify these technologies based on not what generally the market thinks about this, but to what you were saying, Todd. It's we're in the business of X, and our business of X is trying to accomplish these 10 things. We want to take over. We want to be from a national player to an international player. We want to grow our, our margins by this. We want to be able to go into these new industries, et cetera. How will these technologies fuel and enable that? And hopefully, if we're looking at the emerging technology hype cycle, it's not an aspect of optimizing my current business, but how do I leapfrog? How do I take something and say, oh, I get inspired by a business model in another industry? How do I take that business model and apply it to my industry? and create the next Airbnb, the next Uber, the next what have you. So, so Mike, given your experience with, with hype cycles and whatnot, I'd be curious about what your perspective would be on how to deal with a situation like this. Um, I'm going to use digital as a an emerging technology theme as an example. And, and I use that because it, it's really close to home. I mentioned earlier that you and I are working on this digital executive education program at Ohio State. And so digital is really something that comes close to my heart right now. And what I would argue is that if I plotted digital on a hype cycle back in January, I would be just coming out of – um, the slope of enlightenment, or maybe I'd be in that slope of enlightenment. We've gone through the peak of expectations where every company was whitewashing digital on everything. Cisco was trying, trying to tell us that if you put a router in the ceiling, it, you would be digital, right? <laughs> um, but And then we went through this 
this deep trough where everybody complained about the fact that we didn't understand what digital meant and and blah, 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 right? Well, we've started to come out of this, but what I would argue in this situation is that the pandemic has accelerated digital into a rocket ship um, on the hype cycle, right? So it's it's kind of gone from one place where it typically would um, have taken another couple of years to really uh, reach its peak of its plateau. And, yeah. and now it's like, shoo, taken off, right? So how do you deal with technologies? And maybe you can think of other examples of technologies where some socioeconomic or societal or econ- uh, or some other sort of environmental trend has dramatically impacted a technology that's placed on the life cycle and its acceleration through the, the cycle. So, and, uh, you know, I'd love your perspective on this uh, as well, Todd, um, to kind of keep me honest here. Um, so in my opinion, this is where the hype cycle breaks down, where the hype cycle becomes not as useful. So the hype cycle predicates that we're kind of in this kind of stable uh, of more linear journey uh, of of time where you go from stage to stage to stage and there's not a whole lot of zigzagging or what have you. Uh, The hype cycle wasn't built for anything but that. And so I think for what we're this where we're at right now uh, as a world, as an economy, as technologists the hype cycle starts to break down as a construct for that very example that you just gave, Mike. Because uh, academically, I I would say, okay, so digital is now, if I look at it, it should be emerging from the trough of disillusionment and it should be going up to the plateau. Well, now what's happened, I'm moving that thing back up, but it's breaking all sorts of criteria to be at the peak. So yeah. Digital is super, super relevant now for different reasons. So essentially what we've done is we've redefined digital in a lot of ways, or at least we've defined, uh, if we look at who, what, when, where, why, all the interrogatives, we've changed the why equation of why am I doing digital. Before, the reason why I was doing digital was to be more competitive. I, you know, I, I could rest on my laurels a little bit if I was a major player, et cetera, but now... I can't. My entire workforce is gone. They can't come to the building. Um, I got a problem here, right? Mm -hmm. So um, these huge uh, uh, catalyst events. And so I think this goes back to, and and Todd, you're probably familiar with this, uh, uh, economic long wave theory. You know, if you if you talk to an economist, you know, every 50 or so years, there's huge innovations. You know, uh, you know, you go back World War Two. You had the atomic age, you had mass transportation, you had computers, you had uh, telephones, mass communications, et cetera. Uh, that was a catalyst that fueled the economy for 50 years, right? And the internet was a mini little blip. I mean, it, was, it was a kind of a mid economic long wave. But you go back before that, you go back to the turn of the century where people left the farm to go to the factory. It was this the industrial age where unemployment hit huge numbers. We're at that stage right now where we there's fundamental rethinks, there's available technology that allows us to do those rethinks and the speed in which we can do it has greatly accelerated. And you've got these big technology behemoths that are equivalent to, or not equivalent, I would say um, correlates uh, to be a little bit more scientific, correlates to like the Rockefellers back in the day that they own the market on all the technology IP. They own the market on the people that can do it because mainstream companies, talent is tough to get the talent, to keep the talent, etc. They've got the cash reserves to be able to do it. They don't have to answer to shareholders like a traditional company has to because they're redefining the economics. And so for all those reasons, I think that's where the hype cycle starts to break down in today's world. Uh, and before I go too far along a tangent, I'm getting a little parched. I need to get, have another sip of bourbon. But Todd, you know, am I talking BS here? I mean, does this make sense? No, I, I think it does make sense. And I, I'm not sure how the hype cycle intersects with 
today's reality, candidly, where international events, where changes in perception of where society is going seem to really impact business. So, you know, just, just for example, 1980s, where all of a sudden we got into a service economy versus a manufacturing economy, right? Like that's probably still a good thing, probably, right? Uh, but where we see some of these differences of uh, how factors of production move overseas and how uh, it starts with something like steel and then things that get into steel and how the, the entire manufacturing economy in the United States seems to uh, have changed and through a, a combination of offshoring and a combination of automation, there are less things for so many people to do and not to hijack this into a future of work conversation. But these trends have to intersect with the reality of what human beings are doing and what problems we're uh, actually solving. And I, I, I was in an interesting conversation with one of uh, our investors earlier in the week who's in the steel industry who told me things have not changed in 30 years. The fundamentals of this business, of a, of a, a many hundreds of millions of dollar business at hundreds of billions of dollar business have not changed. And that is stunning that so many of the technologies we're talking about have not impacted uh, core businesses that, that employ uh, millions of people uh, across the world. And I, I just wonder if, if we do ourselves a disservice, if we ignore some of the impacts of what happens when you know international powers like uh, China are con helping to control means of production, right? When there is dumping where the whole economics change. I, I just don't know that things fit this neat construct anymore. Yeah. Well, I think, Todd, uh, this is a really, really interesting point. We're going to go way off hype cycle now, right? But <laughs> you talk about this idea of going from an industrial economy to a service economy, and then uh, how these companies that are really fundamentally industrial economy kinds of companies, right, haven't changed in 30 years. And I would, I would, I would propose that, from industrial economy to service economy, the next evolution is digital economy, right? And and the underlying inspiration that that I always go back to in this conversation comes from a book called Exponential Innovation, from Salim Ismail. He wrote it as when he was back as part of Singularity University. I don't know if he's still there or not. If you've not read the book, fascinating book. It's very um, thought-provoking and inspirational. It'll help change your, your mindset and your view of the world. But what it really talks about is this, this key component of taking the physical world and moving it to information-based. And this idea of when you move the physical world to information-based, it enables exponential improvement and innovation, right? It changes your curve. When you're in a physical world, you're inherently in a linear curve, a linear growth curve. In order for you to grow, you have to scale up adding more raw materials, more people, more uh, steel, more product, more crude oil, whatever it is. When you shift from the physical world into the digital world, information can grow infinitely. And it changes your curve. You can now grow your business. You can transform your business on an exponential curve rather than on a linear curve. And that's why I think this digital world makes things really, really interesting. And it's why you see a lot of the success stories that you see, right? What have what have the, the big five, the, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Googles, the Apples done? They've wrapped their business around the digital world and they've changed their curve depending on the company right if you're talking about amazon there's still a physical component if you're talking about apple there's still a physical component but microsoft not as much facebook very little right so depending on the company they they're further down that curve but when you talk about how some of these industrial companies haven't changed in 30 years well it's really hard to take crude oil and the transformation of crude oil into gasoline and 
make that a digital process, right? There's still something inherently physical about that. So what I think we see is that these companies that haven't changed much, it's because they live in a world that has to be inherently physical. So while there are elements of improvement that they can make, if you're limited by the physical, there's only so much you can do and so much you can change. But if you can fundamentally change your organization to, to shift from physical to information-based, you change your curve and you have your opportunity to skyrocket as you scale. So, so Mike, I think, uh, I think you made some good points. And I think, um, I don't know if this is a green disagreeing or, or uh, an adjunct uh, uh, point, but uh, I think that the challenge here, and, and you know, going back to what you're saying, Todd, because I think it's important, is it makes me wonder, based on the, the comments that you made, makes me wonder if us in the technology world, if we are overhyping these technologies, just generally, just broadly, because mm-hmm. we've got all these industries. I mean, hell, I didn't know this. You know, you take the aviation world. I mean, they're 30, 40, 50 years behind. I mean, they're, they're to sell an airplane, you have to have pallets, not a binder, mm-hmm. <laughs> not, 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 you know, a, a wheelie cart, but pallets, multiple pallets of paper that talks about the service history of an airplane. It's crazy town. Um, uh, just the amount of manual process and error rates that are in some of these industries. And it's not just aviation. It's embedded in many of our supply chains uh, that we rely on day in and day out, uh, uh, manufacturing, et cetera. And, you know, the part that I think that I uh, disagree with a little bit, Mike, is in emerging markets like China, uh, you know, if, if we go to a lot of the, the APAC region type of organizations, they're using these digital technologies in their manufacturing process. I'll give you, well, I'll give you a great example. This, this device, Foxconn, uh, and this was four years ago, by the way, they replaced 60,000 workers, 60,000 with reinforcement learning based robotics. Not PLC controller based, the old school stuff, but reinforcement based learning stuff that is fundamentally changing the game, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, where I can have aerial drones that do all the supervised learning on movements and creating p- patterns of the employees and what they're doing, not to survey them, but to understand based on their current behavior, what is the likelihood of an accident based on what they're doing right now? And being within uh, the one company that I talked to, uh, this was uh, Rio Tinto that has the huge autonomous trucks that are, you know, going down in mines and all that. I mean, they were able to cut down um, uh, by 60% the amount of incidents that happen on their, their, their sites. And so, you know, I do agree that in the, some of these more physical based industries that there are a lot of inhibitors. But I think that there's been somewhat of a, whether it's self-inflicted or not, whether it's they've just lived high on the hog too long, like the oil and gas industry, where they're like, look, we're printing money here. We don't Mm -hmm. have to just, I mean, I talked to these companies like 10 years ago and we were talking about optimizing. They're like, we don't, we don't care about that. We we can have the conversation, but we're making money hand over fist. We don't care about that right now. Um, Whether it's that equation or not, I think the reality is with this uh, set of issues, now it's forcing everybody to get on this digital bandwagon. And what does that mean? How do they get there? They're already so far behind. What are the broader economic impacts here? Uh, And so, you know, I don't want to get into economic theory and doom and gloom and, you know, what all that means. But I think it's a good data point that both, both of you guys are bringing up is that, We've got industries that are so far behind that catching up is going to be really tough. And doing the leapfrog, if I'm in the manufacturing world, um, you're, you're, you've got a workforce that isn't prepared for that big of a jump. And how much is it going to radically tr- uh, transform that industry? So it's a very precarious situation. That's why I look at where we're at right now is very akin to the turn of the 20th century is where we are going to continue to see these unemployment numbers because 
of some of these conditions that we're talking about right now. So yeah, we got way off high yeah. Well, uh, it's but it's really interesting, Mike. So so I would uh, and Todd, I'm curious your opinion on this, right? I would argue, right? If if you if you get really pure of the idea of what's the growth curve, is it a linear growth curve or is it an exponential growth curve? I would argue that the application of robotics, say for example, in a manufacturing setting, replacing humans, is actually not changing the nature of the curve. It's changing the, the I'm, now I'm getting the mathematics, I'm gonna get way over my skis here. Is it maybe the slope of the line or whatever it is? I'm changing the line so I'm, I'm seeing a dramatic improvement from going to robotics over people. But what I'm not doing is I still have physical limitations because I'm still manufacturing a physical device. So I'm actually not I, – I still have a linear growth curve. I'm not changing to that exponential growth curve that making that device 100% information-based would do. And so I think there's – there's an element there, and, and I've not – This you're really making me think here, Mike. Um, I've not dug into this really, really deeply, but if I think the real, real opportunity for innovators that are out there listening to our podcast to, to think about is how do you go all the way to full information-based and enable your organization to now be in, a, in an exponential growth curve? Because I think that is what – Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Amazon are doing is they're enabling more and more and more of their business to be exponential, and that's why they're at the top of the market cap. So, so what's, so what's the human... I just want to I just want to insert two things, just two things, um, <laughs> quick. One is humans are analog, and we're trying to live in a digital world. So let's think about that for a second. So if that's the case. Will we ever have full digital products and services? My assertion is no, and we've got the evidence. We've got the evidence with these devices here. We got the evidence of Microsoft got out of the, the, the physical hardware game, and now what the hell are we doing? We're going back, <laughs> right? We're, we're, we're partnering with companies to make uh, uh, universal communications devices. We've built this damn new foldable device. Uh, you know, we're making laptops. Um, and the reason why is because we're tactile, we're humans, we need something to touch and feel. So I think, we'll, in my personal opinion, we'll never get to the full digital, at least in my lifetime, um, until we're all augmented and all geared up. The second is I would encourage us to think about problem sets as multidimensional. And I'll give you an example. So your example about, and I think it's a valid one, Mike, is... If I put a bunch of robotics and replace factory workers, does that really materially change things? Does it just accelerate what I'm doing or does it you know, create an exponential curve? And the answer is no. But the, the subtlety here is, let's take an example of Xbox. Xbox, we make the hardware, but we lose money on the hardware. But we make money hand over fist, hand over fist, so much money on the games and the services around the games. So we're like, shit, we don't care. We'll take a cut on the hardware, but we're going to make it back in, in these other service lines. So the problem with that analogy, Mike, is we have to think about this in a multidimensional way on uh, why are we doing this? What will it enable? And what other products and services will we create? Yeah. So, your, so, uh, so, sorry. So, so your Xbox analogy is that you're Polaroid, except there's no cost of goods sold on the film, right? Right. There's this immense scalability around the film, right? That here's your loss leader, whether it's razors and razor blades, that's that's what transcends it. And, and I think that gets to uh, the, the earlier point about the extent to which uh, robotics and digitalization really is impactful. I think part of it depends on whatever you're delivering, if, it's, if we're talking about products that were previously predominantly in the physical world, how much of that is cost of goods sold, right? The more of that is embedded in cost of goods sold, the less you can bend the curve, the less it can be exponential, right? The, 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 the cheaper it is, the more commoditized it is, the less important to the ultimate value prop that the COGS is, the more you bend that curve all the way, right? And 
uh, being able to digitize, being able to put in robotics changes the whole equation. Right. And yeah. for Taz's world, right, in a ventures world, what are you looking for? You're looking for companies that are bending the curve, right? And if you can find and invest early in those companies that are bending the curve, that's where you're going to make money hand over and fist rather than Mike being the only one that makes money hand over fist. Yeah, I hear you. Mike, I don't, I don't envy you're having to edit all this, by the way. It's just, it's just <laughs> I'm processing that right now that this is not a small endeavor. <laughs> so, you know, as, as the listeners know, the reason, you know, this is all very conversational. So there's very little editing. Yeah. I will have to splice and dice this because this has turned into a very lengthy conversation. <laughs> but so on that theme, to get us back to uh, our original topic that is so big. The in, topic of bourbon? The topic of bourbon, yes. Um, so the molecular, uh, you know, composition of bourbon you know what sort of emerging technologies can we use to <laughs> have make this better no that's going down a whole synthetic whiskey route that you know people are going to throw up all over which i've already had those conversations uh but we'll get to that with me but anywho so let's talk about uh one last thing and then i want to get your guys's individual kind of perspectives on the hype cycle if there was, I don't know, five to 10 technologies that you felt were either underserved or wasn't served at all in the hype cycle, uh, meaning they weren't there, um, you know, were there some of those technologies you just thought were blatant misses that you think people need to know about and understand that these things are coming? We've mentioned two, you know, blockchain and quantum, but uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Were there other technologies that you felt that should be on that list that are not on that list? No, I think for me, I think blockchain and quantum were the real big misses, right? And and they're not necessarily new, but they should have been on there and and visible from a progression standpoint. Um, I think for me the and and it's more art than science, so it's it's incredibly tough. I'm glad I'm not the one right in the the hype cycle, but the idea of of the themes was was what really I struggled with, right? Those those trends or the themes or whatever you want to call them, and and I don't know if uh, obviously our readers may or may not have access to them, but they were composite architectures, algorithmic trust, beyond silicon, uh, formative artificial intelligence, and digital me. The one that jumped out to me is what are you doing was digital me right digital me feels like a trend or a theme five years ago right right that That one i I, and that one really struck out to me is come on guys come catch up right we we've been doing digital me for a long time um the other one um that i really I wasn't a fan of it. It's more of the technology piece. And again, this comes back to this idea of what's a technology and what's not was, uh, let me find it here. Um, This thing's hard to read. I I apologize. Um, Packaged business capabilities. Mm -hmm. I, I read that and I, my immediate thought was how the heck is that a technology? What are you uh, doing, right? Um, and so that to me was the one that jumped out to me is um, just doesn't belong here. And 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 I would even say that one, they've got that on on pretty far on the left side of the curve. And and so again, I'm like, a, it's not a technology. B, we've been talking about microservices and granular business capabilities and and containers and all of the sorts of different things that kind of fit with this modular architectures, et cetera, et cetera. We've been talking about this for so long. How is this just now showing up on your curve, right? So that was, those were the big things for me that that jumped out to me about this hype cycle. Yeah, so uh, one thing, you know, a couple comments uh, quickly and uh, I'll let you uh, add yours there, Todd, as well. Um, 
I had a, a hard and fast rule when, when I wrote these, uh, because what I found was in previous incarnations, and it didn't happen a lot, it happened more on this hype cycle than others, was there was this kind of blending of a named technology and kind of like a discipline or a category of technologies. There was a lot of that that was on this hype cycle. And, you know, the package capabilities thing, I was just like, shit, isn't that SaaS? I mean, I mean, that's what that is. Uh, or, <laughs> you know, uh, there, there, there was a lot of things I was just like, I can't compare apples to apples when you change kind of the, the core taxonomy on me. Um, and so I think that's a challenge, a big challenge that you're that you're highlighting. Um, the digital me, 100% agree. That's like that was table stakes five years ago. Composite architectures. We've been talking about that for a long time, and we talked about that in the smart client object orientation world for a long time. So I just looked at that. I'm just like, I don't know if it was a marketing issue where they just didn't have the right name. Uh, but I read the description. I'm just like, eh, still not feeling it. Right. But the 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 other ones which were interesting was algorithmic trust and beyond silicon. And so I was like, algorithmic trust. Well, that's blockchain. You just describe blockchain, and you don't even have it on your damn list. Um, right. And then you know, beyond silicon, I'm like, oh, so that means beyond classical computing. What does that mean? It means quantum computing. Right. Right. Anywho, so so Todd, uh, what did you think? Were, were there big misses in your mind? I think you nailed it candidly. Okay. Yeah, and you know, as far as some of the other things that that I saw, you know, some of the big trends. We talked about the sustainability stuff. We talked about the energy stuff. So, you know, uh, while I wasn't expecting things like terraforming to be on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was kind of expecting maybe self-powered buildings, maybe smart glass, uh, maybe uh, battery tech uh, would be another that crosses many, many different industries. Um, you know, I had, and this is something I'm very passionate about. And Mike, since you're in the insurance world, it'd be good to get your perspective. But an area that I think is a huge miss, huge, huge miss is the autonomous everything world. Um, they removed autonomous vehicles from the list. They removed autonomous flying vehicles from the list. Mm -hmm. um, the robotics world, I mean, I was talking to companies uh, when I was at Gartner um, that had robotics that were doing remote surgeries thousands of miles away. Someone would get into a chair, like a massage chair, lay down and have gears or whatnot, and was able to do a, a surgery. And this was more in kind of battle areas. So this was like in the Middle East type of stuff. But yeah. you can definitely see where that applies just as much now in some of these areas. So, um, you know, the autonomous uh, uh, vehicles, I think, is going to be is going to be, you know, accelerated as a direct result of the pandemic. I think flying vehicles, I know it's controversial. I know it seems like the Jetsons. But I think it's more realistic to have a regional transport with an autonomous flying vehicle uh, than it is with a land vehicle because I don't deal with people in the air. That's all controlled airspace. I can have a level of autonomy and not deal with a four-way stop and not yelling at someone, it's not your turn, damn it. It's my turn. Um, so I, I don't know. What, what, what do you think about that, Mike? So... I actually uh, disagree with you. Okay. So I believe that autonomous vehicles are being slowed by the pandemic rather than accelerated. And here's why. The, the companies that have focused on autonomous vehicles, with the exception of maybe a Tesla and some of the real venture companies, right, um, have... Uh, the the Ubers, the the Fords, the the GMs, the the really big companies that are spending a lot of money on that space um, have been hit pretty hard by the pandemic and are redirecting funds elsewhere. And so I think what what I have seen in my conversations about autonomous vehicles is in the short and medium term that it's actually going to be slowed down because that that investment money is going elsewhere. 
Um, it doesn't change the need. I think the need is accelerating, but the investment into it is not. And that's where I think that that dichotomy is is shifting. I think in the long term, um, I think you might you might be right. I think in the long term perspective, I think autonomous will be even more important than ever uh, because of the societal shifts that are happening. People, more importantly, whether it's important or not, is is not really the thing. What's the thing is, are people receptive to it? Right. Right. Are you receptive to stepping into that vehicle and not having a driver there and having that vehicle, that Uber vehicle take you somewhere? Right. Um, I think that's what you're going to see is that this pandemic is going to change people's perceptions about what's acceptable in all um, generations much more quickly than anything else we've ever seen particularly in elderly generations, right? I, we talk about this all the time at, at Nationwide. What, what our, a lot of our audience, a lot of our customers are 50 and older, right? Because we do a, we have our insurance business, which is uh, a little bit more broad, but we have our uh, investments business, which focuses on retirement savings and life insurance and whatnot. And we, we tend to skew a little bit older. And so our population is has historically not been receptive to using technology. Well, this pandemic has said, I don't care. You got to figure it out, right? Grandma yeah. and grandpa are now using Facebook to communicate with their kids because the kids can't come by to visit. It's, if, it's either use it or don't get that interaction, right? And so the some of the the elder generations have been forced to um, figure out how to leverage technology in new and different ways. And and without that pandemic, I I think it would have been okay to say, yeah, you know what? I don't care. I'm not going to do it, right? Well, that's not been that's not been an option because we want to interact with people. And technology has been the only way. And I think the, the, we're just starting to figure out what the ramifications of that are going to be long term. That's really the biggest thing from our industry, the, the technology industry perspective. The impact of the pandemic is going to be just waves and waves of understanding of the mindset change in customers. In, in users around their willingness to use technology, it's just going to be fundamentally different going forward. I think the, I like question, uh, the, the autonomous question is an interesting one, but in my mind, it's not a matter of if, it's just when, right? Yeah. The, the future is clearly full autonomy. Uh, in a generation, people won't know what steering wheels are, right? Their vehicles are just going to be something that gets us from one place to the next and it gets just as much to the form factor as it does the concept of ownership right why do we all need to own these uh vehicles and although i i, I agree with you mike i don't see uh full autonomy coming in the next say five years on most roads simply because of just the challenge of edge cases and how you keep people safe around kids and pedestrians and strollers and balls and the, the typical last mile thing versus on the highway. I think we see just in the features that are available on cars today from you know, a couple of years ago, or more than a couple of years ago now, smarter cruise control, so parking assist, right? I mean, the, the, the vision that uh, vehicles have today, it's changing every year, whether we you know, want it to or not, and we're getting closer and closer and closer in, in the more of these vehicles that are essentially uh, driving computers that are fully updatable, uh, it feels like it's gonna be a snap. And I don't know how you transcend the state regulations, right? Of, uh, and, and of course the insurers have to be there with you, but it does feel like it could sneak up on us a lot faster than we think. And the idea of this becoming something that happens in the air, I think is really fascinating because you do transcend all the edge cases, right? You're, you're dealing with space with the exception of you know, uh, drones and, and, and uh, uh, other potential obstructions, it becomes a, a simpler math, right? To actually get something from point A to point B. 
Uh, so as reliability increases, it, it feels like the future is going to be here faster than we might need or want. Yeah, and you know, I think you brought up a good point around uh, essentially the Department of Transportation. Um, you know, they're the big holdup in, in a lot of this equation. So if the Department of Transportation said, and again, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, there's five levels of autonomy, right? Today, we're at two, maybe three, you know, pushing three, we're more at two. Um, what we're talking about with full autonomy is that four and five level of autonomy where you can take a, a nap in the back seat and everything's taken care of for you. Um, if the federal government, if the Department of Transportation said, hey guys, it's, it's street legal to have an L4, L5 on the roads two years from now, what do we think would happen? Every damn one of these companies would be building that capability. Um, I know this because I've had those conversations. And I think as far as, I'm less worried about the Fords of the world. They've got really great R&D and they've actually pioneered a lot of the autonomous stuff back in the 80s. I mean, this goes back a long, long time. I mean, so we talk about a hype cycle. I mean, this is, goes back a while. Um, and it was pretty good back then. Um, but what I'm more concerned about is while these big companies have to go back to their shareholders and say, we're bleeding in all these areas, we can't afford to go into these more futuristic R&D efforts, this will open up opportunity for the Ubers of the world, for the Apples of the world, for the Googles of the world, for the Teslas of the world to create that capability to say, we don't need a billion vehicles on the road. We only need 200,000 on the road because 95% of the time, human beings are stationary. They're either work, they're home in their bed sleeping. The majority of the time, they're not even utilizing this form of transportation. We can optimize all of that. And so that's really kind of what I'm thinking in the back of my head is that transportation as a service, where that autonomous level, whether it's a cab, where, whether it's a Cadillac, whether it's a convertible, an SUV, a, a train, or whatever, I have the options available to me via a mobile device. I say, yes, I just want to go from here to here, and it's going to give me the best option, and it's going to take care of it for me. Yep. So... Um, with that said, so those are some of the things that we saw were, were you know, possibly missing on the list. Uh, to kind of cap all this off, because we've been talking a while about this, and we could probably talk for another couple hours about this. Um, from each one of your perspectives, and, and, you know, let's start with you, Todd. Um, how do you think, so one, how would you use this type of tool, this hype cycle, in some of your day-to-day -day decisioning, planning, talking with clients, making investment decisions, how is it used? And couple that with any recommendations that you wanna give people on, you know, based on your VC perspective on what you would, knowledge you'd like to impart upon them. And then we'll move to Mike, you know, from a different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So in my mind, it's, it's a little bit less about validating the tech or validating investment theses and more about a guide to, to guide to traverse the landscape, right? And, and, and ask questions. Uh, and, and I'm a, a generalist technology investor. So I tend to think more about those secular trends that you know, drive the needs uh, versus the individual technologies. Uh, but it, it, in, in my mind, it, it truly is more about what this means in the day to day, uh, what our company should be doing today and how it impacts uh, behavior, behavior with uh, companies, behavior with consumers. And despite the five to 10 year uh, potential for this, I think if we don't see signals in two to five years, it's hard to get excited about five to 10. Yeah. In anything that you would, uh, uh, whether it be a recommendation or um, a piece of advice that you would give people, uh, you know, around the hype cycle that from your perspective? I guess it's a deep breath. I mean, when I, when I looked at what you, sh you shared, I had to Google about half of the definitions, right. To, to actually feel like I understood and I, I had this up before, right. Uh, what uh, citizen twin means, right. 
that, right. that doesn't, doesn't mean anything to me, right? So, uh, and, and that's fairly high up the curve. Uh, so, so it, it, in my mind, it's, it, it's take a deep breath, uh, think about the, the general applications of technology. But with that said, uh, you know, like Mike Fulton, I, I was intrigued with your comment earlier about how to balance what I'm saying with the idea of what's the value of thinking about technology broadly, holistically, to open up the possibility of what could happen next. And what would we do if we take away uh, the uh, constraints that we have in today's environment? And I, I think that's a really intriguing way to look at it as well. Yeah, and that's, I think, a wonderful segue, Todd, to, to my, um, my response to Mike, which is, the, how would I use the hype cycle? I would use it to open up your aperture. Use it to broaden your thinking. Use it to inspire you about what's possible. And and that to me, more than where something shows up on which part of the curve, is yeah. the real value. We talked a lot about how they got it wrong and blah, 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 right? But to me, the real value, the importance, the credit to Gartner on putting this together is it starts a conversation. In this case, a one plus, two plus, like you said, we could go on three or four plus hour conversation if we want to um, around this stuff. But it's it's all starting a conversation. And for me, that's the important part. As technologists, as IT strategists, as people that are looking at making ventures investments in, in companies that um, are leading the way and are leading the thinking, Starting the conversation, having some of these discussions and starting to think a little bit more broadly versus what we see day to day is is the value of the hype cycle. To Todd's point, um, I've had engagements with um, a gentleman named Doug McCullough, who's the CIO at the city of Dublin here in Ohio. And so um, Doug and I have talked a lot about digital twin or citizen twin. I mean, right. That's one of the things that he's really passionate about. He's passionate about figuring out how to leverage blockchain to enable a citizen twin. So for me, citizen twin wasn't a big. So what's that? Right. I, I got it immediately and knew right what it was. But there were 15 other technologies on this hype cycle that I had to do the exact same thing Todd did. Google them, figure out what the heck this means. And and it opened up my mind. And that's the real benefit, the real value, and that's what I hope your podcast listeners get out of this, Mike, is I hope and I hope they've gotten an opportunity to open up their mind from our discussion, and I hope if they dig into the hype cycle, that's what they use it for, to open up their minds around what's possible, because that's truly amazing. What is possible with technology in today's day and age is just fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, what you're highlighting, and I, and I think it's important for us to explicitly call out, whenever you get a group of smart people together, you can critique anything. And believe or me. Or you get people drinking bourbon especially, together. Especially drinking bourbon. Um, and, you know, working at Gartner, you know, uh, you develop a thick skin. You're peer reviewed by everybody there. Um, and so if anybody from Gartner is listening to this, which I know there's a few people that do, um, they probably won't admit it, but I know they do. Um, they've got a thick skin. They're not, they're like, okay, yeah, I've heard this before. Uh, but I think you've made some really good macro points and I'm going to bubble it up a little bit from my perspective. Cause I'm cheating a little bit cause I've done some of this one. I think what it does is it gives us a vocabulary. It gives us a way to talk about all the complexity in the technology world. Gardner profiles over 2,000 uniquely named things. That's a lot of stuff. They're going and defining it. They're creating an industry profile around it. They're understanding kind of where it's on that, their squiggly line, which is just one way of representing it, but it provides us some data. So if anything, the hype cycle provides is it provides us a common language that we can have a conversation around these things and say, well, shit, I didn't know that digital twins had all these different variants that we have digital twins of buildings, we have digital twins of cities, countries, citizens, uh, of objects, 
of all these different things, I can create digital twins. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Great. Um, and so what it does is it gives us that common vocabulary. So then how I would use this in environments like Mike's environment is now we don't have to go into the think tank and invent definitions or try to search definitions for what this is. We've got a source that goes through a bit of rigor around defining what all this stuff means. And so, so valuable, incredibly so valuable because that is such hard work. And so what you're doing is you're allowing Gartner to be kind of the Wikipedia for innovation for you, uh, which there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but like with everything and what we've been doing, we've been using the trust but verify method. Um, yes, we trust that they've done their homework and they've made the decisions based on really good sound thinking. However, we look at things from different angles. And I can tell you, I've been at an end user company like Mike. I've been a consultant. Uh, I haven't been in your world, Todd. Uh, I've, I, I work for a big evil vendor. Um, I've seen all these and I've been an analyst. I can tell you, everyone has their own perspective. There's not a right or wrong perspective, but we have to understand and be inclusive and understand that, hey, there are these different perspectives. There's have a very specific lens on the marketplace and just bringing that in is so valuable. Uh, and so uh, if there's anything that I would impart to folks listening to this about all the critiques that we've been making is we're looking at this from all the different angles, not just one. Yeah. Right, gentlemen. Well, listen, this has been incredibly fun. I I'm really happy that you guys decided to uh, join me on this little adventure and uh, look forward to having you guys back on the podcast. Maybe not quite as lengthy, but uh, uh, head back on. Thanks, Mike. Hey, Cheers. Thanks having us. You to this and, you know, broke up the conversation in multiple parts. Uh, did that appeal to you? Uh, do you want to see more of that or less of it? You know, definitely let us know in the comments, uh, you know, and provide whatever feedback as well. If you want, you know, more of a particular topic or less of a particular topic, uh, would definitely love to hear from all of you. So, with that, we'll see you next time.